This sprawling mansion is being restored with great care because underneath it is thought to lie a medieval hospital. But that might just be the start of it. The owners called in our very own Mick Aston, who stumbled across something rather surprising in the garden. So the fact that we're here is all down to you. Yeah, I'm afraid it is, actually. I, I, I was asked to come here and look at this building and then wandered off and looked at the grounds around it, thought it was really interesting and we ought to come back and do more work. I bet you're great to employ. You are asked <laughs> to look at this fantastic place and you're poking around the back. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a medieval uh, hospital on the site, but up on the hill at the back, we found 10th century pottery. So that's Anglo-Saxon? Yeah. When you say you found it, where was it? It, it, was, it was in the vegetable patch on the top of the hill, but it's earlier than the date of the town of Burford when that's found in the 12th century. So there's something here that much earlier. And finding that was sufficiently exciting for you to come to us and say, I really want to dig it. So, medieval hospital or Anglo-Saxon settlement? It looks like Mick's got us looking for both in this massive garden. That's over a 1,000 years of history to sort out. At least our search for the hospital should be fairly straightforward. Fingers crossed, John's radar has picked up part of it under the front lawn. It means we can put in our first trench straight away. This should be a doddle, shouldn't it? Gary? Look at that, hopeless. Oh dear, the first cut is the hardest. Typical, isn't it? Mick Aston comes here, he finds Saxon pottery. What do I find? White china. Oh well. Stop moaning, Phil. You've got the easy job. Our second target is the vegetable garden, and it's going to be a lot harder. This is where Mick found his mysterious Anglo-Saxon pottery, and he wants us to scour it for more. It's not exactly small, so we've called in some extra help. Anybody? More people up here. But organising his class proves a little difficult for archaeologist Professor Dumbledore. So each group of three go to a tray. Just put it back right. when you found Oh, well, that's now. the best way. We'll put your arms around each other. And no, then don't start, don't start digging tray. yet. Don't start Treza. digging yet. You're all right. That's right. Come on, Phil. So that's another one on yeah. the same same alignment. Look. So that's three. That dates for about the time of William the Conqueror. So that's really, 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 really old. So that's great. I mean, that's fantastic. I mean, you've been doing this for about ten minutes, have you? Something like that. <laughs> Got another one. Four <laughs> in a line. <laughs> So, young time team 47, professional archaeologists 4. Phil's in danger of being out dug by a bunch of nine-year-olds. Our young diggers have now found so much late Saxon pottery that we can plot it all on a map. We're going to put in a trench where there's a hot spot. So, we say cheerio to one team. And say hello to another. Mick, alarm bells are ringing in my mind. If we were looking for the medieval hospital, fine. If we were looking for a Saxon burr, fingers crossed, maybe we would yeah. find it. But this seems to me to be much more scattergun. Surely what we ought to be doing in archaeology is either proving something or disproving it. It, well, yes, you could look at it like that, but it's actually more of an evaluation of what is a very big garden. You see, the, part of the problem, I think, is that with a lot of archaeological work, we dig because we know or we think there's something there of a certain date. There's actually stuff all over the place. Yes, but will we get a story? I think it's worth seeing how many periods of occupation we've got represented here. So, you know, I'd like to try this with what is, after all, a big garden. I mean, it's almost, it's a bigger version of thousands of gardens. That's stretching it a bit, Mick. This place is huge. Over on the front lawn, Phil's row of stones has turned into the corner of a large wall, which lines up perfectly with the geophys. Could this be our medieval hospital? Well, some 13th century hospitals could be very big. 
but most had two main buildings, a long infirmary hall for the sick and a chapel, either on the end or on the side. So which one does Phil have? You can't tell whether you're outside or inside there, can you? Oh, surely I must be inside. I mean, that's got to be an outside wall or at least part of an outside wall and then turning round and going round there. I'm sure that must be outside and I'm on the inside. And just to prove Phil doesn't make this stuff up, look at this lovely floor tile. It must mean we're inside a building. This is exactly the sort of thing you'd expect to find in a very posh 13th, yes. 14th century yes, building. Yes, it is, isn't it? Like yeah. a chapel. Yes, yeah. yes. So this could be one of our hospital buildings, the chapel. And the second, the hall, might be closer than we think. Come here and have a look at these. These scenes here, Richard, <clears throat> are they the sort of thing that I should be finding in my trench? You should be. These genuine medieval late 13th century. You see, the thing of it is that the, what we think is the outside wall of the building in my trench lines up over there. It doesn't line up through here. Does that mean to say these are not in their original position? They've been moved? Yes, All and right. they've been reduced in height because during the restoration 1908 by Colonel Sal de la Terriere, he discovered this portion of arcade in that wall. And I can show you where it is. So if you look, if you imagine those two arches, where they're reduced in size, came out of this section of the wall. So we would have a, a, a row of arches just like that, literally coming right the way back down through here. Yeah, all the way through. So if Phil's right, then we might have an aisle with an arcade running under the house. That would tie in quite nicely with the idea of a chapel at the end of an infirmary hall. So, pretty impressive work by Phil. But then Mick just has to go one better. Are you getting anything, Paul? Oh, yes, are we? Um, funny enough, there was very little in the soil as we got down. Yeah. As we were going down through it. And once we got near the bottom there, and where Faye was troweling, there's what looks like a linear feature, and that came out of it. Now, that's the Cotswolds work, but that's the early stuff. That's pre-conquest. That's late 10th oh, or 11th right. century. Right. And it's actually right. sticking out of a feature. We've got features in this trench. Are we talking buildings or settlements or well, something like that? Well, I think it's a building. I mean, as a bonus, we got this out as well, which is a large lump of daub, which has been burnt, so possibly off a Watland daub a building Watland or an oven. A Watland daub or an oven or something yeah. like that. And a pig tooth as well. Oh, so <laughs> it's starting to look like domestic refuse, well, it really that's is. that's very good, isn't it? Yeah. I like it. There's possibly a couple of post holes down there. It's still being cleaned up. Um, Faye's going to get it all sorted out, hopefully, in the near future. This is fantastic news. Whisper it carefully, but this could be the first hint of an Anglo-Saxon house. And I can count on one hand the number of those we've ever found on Time Team. Yeah. 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 Oh, what? <laughs> oh, look at that. Oh, that's so a big lump of metalworking slag. So we've got metal possible slag, timber building. Metalworking slag. Possible piece of an oven dome, yeah. timber building. Timber building, pottery, Ooh, domestic food waste with the pig bone. It's only going to get better, isn't it? Let's hope so. It's only going to get better. Our hospital could start just 50 years after the Saxon village ended. And instead of the two buildings, we could have just one. An early Norman chapel with a later arcade added on. So, great theory, guys. We just need to find one arcade. So, so 67 meters, from here. Two meters so from that. So, it's two metres from there. Up until a few minutes ago, I thought this archaeology here was part of the 13th century hospital, which we know exists because of the history books. But now they've started looking at it closer, some of the archaeologists are starting to think that this stuff is older, older than anything we know about here. Maybe it's part of an earlier phase of the hospital which stretched back in this direction. And the only way to find out whether that hypothesis is true or not is to put in a big hole here, which is why Phil and John are doing this measuring, which is fine, that's their job as archaeologists, except look at this place. Never mind the tulips, that is a listed building. It's a Grade 1 listed building. You can't just slap in any old hole, what, one and a half metres from the foundations, although they seem perfectly happy about it. I think Shut somebody... Up. 
Hey, hang on a minute. I'm talking to the camera. Well, yeah, I know you are, but we're putting in a trench. You're putting in a trench right by a Grade 1 listed building. Yeah, have you got permission to do that? Yeah. You, you haven't. That is yes, not true. You, no, yeah, you have, have no permission to do yes, that Yes, we yet. have. He hasn't. Someone's yes, going to have, have to make some phone calls. Yes, we Don't have. Don't say, yes, we have, yes, we have. It's you childish. See? Yes, no, we yeah. have. Since the filming of this programme, Phil's asked me to tell you that, yes, he had. Or so he says. Over in the vegetable garden, which I hasten to add isn't Grade 1 listed, Faye's got a rare foundation trench for a timber Saxon house. It was definitely gone by 1100, but when was it built? It's hard to tell. The pottery from it could be as early as 450 AD, and we're also getting Roman stuff as well. To you and I, a bit of pot is a bit of pot, but to expert Paul Blinkhorn, this stuff is key to dating our site. Now, I know that's St Neot's work, cos you told me that. <laughs> it's true. What period's that? Well, it's the typical sort of early, late Saxon pottery we get in this part of the world. I mean, it starts about uh, 900, possibly even as early as 850. And again, this is a bowl, but um, it's different to the Cotswolds were. So, we're talking about this? About that sort of size, yeah. yeah. You do t sometimes find them with sockets on the side, like spouts, but we think they were actually for putting wooden handles in, so you could use them as a frying pan. It's not nearly as sophisticated, this stuff, as the stuff which preceded it, the Roman work. Yeah, I mean, the, the Roman pottery production was generally a lot more organised and sophisticated than, than the Saxons. They had full-time potters throwing stuff on wheels, firing it in big kills, really, really churning the stuff out. The commonest form of early Saxon pottery's got animal dung mixed in with it. Animal dung? Yes. Why did they use that? You mix it in with the, the clay, you fire the pot, all the organic material burns out, and you're left with quite a corky pot. It means, even though it's quite crudely made, when you put it on the fire, it'll expand and contract without cracking, so it's, it's a functional thing. Unless they liked animal dung in their pottery, I don't know. Well, slightly more information than I wanted. But how on earth did they first discover that animal dung is good for making pottery? Lucky for us that someone did, because we're now starting to find this so-called Anglo-Saxon poo pottery out front as well. It's coming from this dark layer of earth that Matt's digging, under the hospital floor. It's really quite tight date-wise. We've got lots of the, um, the Cotswolds were, the sort of Saxo-Norman stuff that we're getting in the garden. But you've got a couple of other bits of stuff, uh, Kennet Valley were, that doesn't come in until about 1050. So, I mean, looking at this, this feature, whatever it is, dates to about 1050, 1100. Right. Really tight. So it's got to be earlier than this, all these stone walls that are cut through it. Mm. So it looks like we've got an early Norman hospital Got sitting it. right on top of Saxon demolition material. Phil can now quite clearly see two Norman building phases. He hasn't found the arcade or any of its arches yet, but he has found the edge of the 13th century extension. Now we have got that wall yep. coming through there and then turning and coming back on itself there. Everything we're finding points to something significant taking place around the year 1100. I've been wandering around the gardens and walls around here. Looking, looking Stuart's for... search around the town has led him right back to the garden. And he thinks he's identified the heart of our Saxon settlement, the original road along which it grew up. He reckons this back street here once carried on to the river. Today, there's a 17th century chapel in the way, but there's a clue in the south wall. What is interesting is the uh, geophysics, the radar that was, was done in here. There's the chapel there. And you see that line coming through oh, underneath right. the, the yeah. floor there? Well, if you look down on the outside of the building, look what's sticking out there. Ah, right. To an, an ignoramus like me, it looks as if the chapel sits on top of that, that masonry. It... What do you think about it? Looking at it, it does. I mean, obviously, a bit of measurement like that doesn't match the rest of the wall. Mm. It's so a, It's pretty shoddy, isn't it? It is pretty shoddy, but if it was there originally and they were building a chapel on top of it, it wouldn't matter because it would be below the ground level. Right. Stewards noticed that this block of stone continues the line of the old road. He doesn't think it's actually the Saxon road itself, but he does think it might be the boundary wall of the medieval hospital which was built on top of it. The only way to prove it is to dig inside the chapel. 
But that's going to have to wait until tomorrow. Because the rest of us need a well-earned drink. <laughs> Something really weird has started happening. Earlier this afternoon, all our archaeologists were getting really excited about what they'd found. They were going, oh, we've got two phases of medieval archaeology over here. Uh, over here, there's this massive Anglo-Saxon site. Even we've got this vast Roman wall, and yet in the past five minutes or so, and it's probably something to do with the fact that we've all been drinking this stuff, those same archaeologists have been tiptoeing up to me and saying, actually, we're not really quite so sure that we've got what we thought we had, which is crazy. We came here to solve the mysteries of this house. I now feel as though we've come no further forward than we were when we started. And in addition to that, They've all started getting really intrigued by this place, the chapel, which they hadn't even looked at until late this afternoon. They're quite mad. It's going to be a lot of work tomorrow. Beginning of day three, and things are quiet here at Burford Priory. Too quiet. Two days ago, Mick promised me that he'd be able to tell the story of this place before we go home. But this big garden keeps throwing up more questions than we can answer. Yesterday afternoon, our archaeologists were really excited. They'd found this beautiful medieval hospital here. Just a few questions about its shape. Was it narrow or was it much fatter with two side aisles? In order to sort that out, they put in this highly controversial trench here, very close to the side of the house, and it proved absolutely inconclusive. This stonework here is just some garden feature or something, so that was a total waste of time. So have we got the two side aisles? Well, this appears to be one of them. It goes along here like that and then turns like that. This stuff in the middle here, that's just rubble. What about the other side aisle? Well, that ought to be where this light blue plastic is, but according to John's geophys, there doesn't seem to be anything there at all. So, Mick, have we got a wonky chapel with one side aisle? Well, we might have. I mean, it might just have a north aisle, but we think we ought to look where the plastic is. Even though there's nothing on the geophysics, there might still be a robber trench that shows us that there was an aisle butted onto the chapel at that point. Show me the nothing. <laughs> <laughs> there's the corner of the chapel, Yeah. and there is nothing. So has it been robbed out? Did it ever exist? So that's where we want to look. So, with one day left, we're quite literally digging for all or nothing. And it isn't just Phil who's going for broke. We've got to tie our hospital in the front to the Saxon village out back. So we're taking a leap of faith by opening a final trench inside the present-day chapel. Under the altar lies a strange block of stone. The more romantic of us think it could be a tomb. But Stuart suspects it might be the boundary wall of the medieval hospital, which follows the line of the old Saxon road. So that's the front. But what about the Roman wall in the back? We've now got a Roman coin from the same trench, but is everything what it seems? So it's a Roman coin but it's got two loops for fastening yeah. over a strap. That's right, a strap. That's very interesting because it's a very common early Anglo-Saxon practice to salvage Roman coins and mount them up as jewellery. So it supports the impression we're getting of an early Anglo-Saxon settlement here. So are we looking at the Roman stuff the wrong way round, or are we just plain wrong? Yeah. I hear that the, uh, the story here has changed yet again. It has, but it's not Roman. It's not Roman? <laughs> no. So you're absolutely right, but also absolutely wrong. I'm afraid so, yeah. Why are you so sure it isn't Roman now, where yesterday you were convinced it was? Well, we've got this pit here that is Saxo-Norman. Oh, I see. So uh, this can't be Roman because the Saxons came after the Romans, so you couldn't have a Roman wall on top of a Saxon yeah. pit. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Anything else? And also, we've got this ironstone here yeah. um, that wasn't used as a building material to the late 1600s. Well, that seems so... fairly <laughs> conclusive, doesn't it? Paul! 
Paul Blinkhorn, world famous authority on pop. <laughs> it was Roman yesterday, this war. It was indeed Roman yesterday, but it's not anymore. Well, at least we now know that our story begins with the Saxons in the area of the back garden. Faye, are you still happy you've got an Anglo Saxon house? Definitely, without a shadow. And do we know the date? Yeah, um, there's a few more rather scruffy bits of pottery coming out of the beam slots, but I don't see any reason to sort of change the dating from yesterday. Which is what? Middle Saxon. Dates? A 650 to 850. Can you show me your house? I am, if you follow me. We're now in the entries of the house. Yep. And so what we've got down here is a beam slot. So that's one wall there. That's one wall. Faye, 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 Faye. What's this thing here? This is a pit. It's had pottery, it had bone in, and probably from when they constructed the building, they put a load of stuff in. All right. So if we walk this way, yeah. we've got another pit here, which is actually where I got a load of animal bone. And this could possibly be like the hearth area, where they had their final meal before they scarpered. Yeah. And then if we keep walking down this way to here, this is the end of our house. It's pretty small, isn't it? It is, but it's cosy. Our Saxon house is a little gem. We hardly ever find timber buildings as old as this one. The small village it belonged to was founded sometime after 650 AD, before vanishing around 1100. Take it away, Mr Storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> so you know where your school is, you know where the river is, you know where the main road is up the middle of the town, OK? First bit of the story we can't put on here. You found Roman pottery we don't know where the Roman site is. The bit you also found was lots of Saxon pottery. And we now think there's a Saxon settlement, Saxon village somewhere here. My lovely assistant, <laughs> Stuart, Debbie McGee of the archaeological world, will put on a little Saxon there's building, Saxons. right? And that lasts from about 400 AD right through to about 1100 AD. And then sometime after 1100, they build the new town down the main street. That's where your houses come in. So take the Saxon village away, because everybody's moved into the town, right? The village goes away. And then all down the main street, build the houses. Put your there. there. Leave a gap here. Yeah. Yeah. Pass them up, there we go. There we go. Do the other end like that, look. Here we are, mate. Well, they, 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 they can put them on there, look. No, the ones at the back couldn't reach. I can only, oh, right. I can only reach so far. There we go. More houses, mate. Oh, it's filling up with new people, it's this town, isn't it? Over, isn't it? Oh, the chimney's falling off. <laughs> <laughs> Once the town is built, the hospital, which is on this Thanks site, where the poor people and the sick people were looked after, was built next to your school. And that then went on right the way through to about the time of the Tudors, when that was taken down and on the site was built the beginnings of this big house here. Yeah. So there it is. And that's more or less as it is today, isn't it? Big house at the Priory, the parish church and the town all laid out along the street. So we've just looked at over a thousand years of history. <laughs> Burford's got talent. <laughs> Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. And you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. One hot day in 1922, a young man called John Poole strolled across this Sussex Down. He was the victim of a First World War gas attack and he came here looking for fresh air and a bit of peace. But what he found may be one of the very few Stone Age settlements ever discovered in England. But he wasn't an archaeologist, he was a 23-year-old gramophone salesman, which made him highly unpopular with the archaeological elite. Now, 80 years after he first set foot on this hill, Time Team have come here to reassess his work. Is this really the site of a prehistoric village? And what about the mysterious second site, which he recorded but is now lost? I don't get it, Miles. There's lumps and bumps all over the place, as far as the eye can see, except here. Yeah, this whole area was landscaped in the 1950s. They bulldozed it and it's been ploughed ever since. So what do you think might be here? 
what I think is here is one of the most important prehistoric sites in the country. That just tripped off the tongue, didn't it? It did, it did indeed. Evidence. Um, well, effectively, in the 1920s, a local archaeologist, John Poole, uh, investigated at least 100 flint mine shafts in this field over to our right. These are shafts cut right down into the chalk to extract the flint. This is his map? This is his map here, yes. So it's this, this way around, yeah? Yeah. And what he found on the other side is a whole range of, of mounds containing human burial deposits, and beyond that, what he calls a, a range of dwelling pits. So it sounds like there's a real archaeological prize to be won. It's just that it's a heck of a big size. Yeah, well, that's the problem with what we've got here. I mean, this is the, the only evidence we've got of it on this map, and, of course, it's, it's not particularly to scale. If you said to me, where are we now, we're sort of... <laughs> somewhere yeah, in yeah, there. Yeah, that's exactly it. So mm -hmm. if John Poole was right, and if the whole site hasn't been trashed by thousands of years of human activity or by the bulldozer, then we could find some fantastic archaeology. But that's an awful lot of ifs, isn't it? Do you think work still needs to be done to reinstate him and his archaeology? Yes. However good an archaeologist he was, that was 1922, and techniques have come mm. a heck of a long way. I mean, just having geophysics on the site, I'm mm. sure he would yeah, have relished. Loved it. Yeah. Beryl, if he's like any of the archaeologists that I know, his spirit will be hovering mm. over us, going, no, put that trench there. No, don't dig in that field. Dig in that field. <laughs> that's what my daughter, she said, I do hope he's looking down and seeing all that's <laughs> being done now. <laughs> Right now, we're looking for the Neolithic houses he said he found somewhere on Long Furlong Farm. He thought these were small circular huts cut into the chalk and that they were home to the flint miners, a kind of prehistoric pit village. If this is one of the houses he discovered, we should see loose soil from where he backfilled his trenches. You got anything, Bridge? Absolutely nothing, <laughs> John. All we seem to have here is natural chalk. You know, the way that's been laid down, that is not backfill, that is just decayed chalk. Look, a discoidal scraper, it's just come out of the topsoil and the grass. So we have got something here. Yep. That's lovely, isn't it? Look, you can see there, where the, it's the working edge, isn't it? Yep. And just held it and used it like that. <laughs> You're going to have to have another look. Wicked. No, oh, come on, it's in the topsoil. Yeah, oh, I think that's you. a victory as far as I'm concerned. You would. <laughs> but let's face it, it's hardly evidence of a prehistoric pit village. It's more likely to have come from the massive mining complex just across the track that was discovered and dug by John Paul. Nothing in that trench. And Phil's trench looks equally unpromising. You think that there's an obvious difference between that brown stuff and that white. But you've got to remember what the character of this chalk is. It's a soft rock. Yeah. And when it gets wet, if it, it'll, it'll rot. Yes. And when it rots, and look at the way it's, it's, it's trending that way. It's trending down the slope. In other words, the way True. water would run off down a slope, I think that's just a geological feature. That's going to cause our response. Yes. I can't tell from looking at the plot whether that's geological or archaeological. And there's nothing archaeological in it. Well, look, if John's got no evidence and we want to test Paul's conclusions about these dwellings, we just dig a hole down the slope and see whether we can find them. And my only concern is you're going to dig a trench and keep digging a trench. There's no guarantee we are going to hit anything. We don't know whether these dwellings are that close to Barrow. Have you got a better idea? Not at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so we've abandoned two of our trenches and our 21st century technology in favour of Phil's archaeological instincts. It's much the same way that John Paul would have worked over 80 years ago. The plan now is to open a long trench right across the area where we think the dwellings might be. But a disturbing idea is taking shape. Either the settlement's been destroyed, or John Poole, archaeological pioneer and unsung hero, made a mistake. Francis! Boss, it's a big area strip you've got here. Well, I reckon so, Phil. I mean, we found out last night that the ditch hadn't been fully dug out by Paul. This solid stuff on the edge is, in fact, the original Neolithic ditch filling. And it's going to have artefacts that we'll be able to date the feature. Ah. So it seems to me what we want to do is strip half the barrow. Yeah. Let's, you know, see what he missed on the interior, if he did miss anything. Well, I'm going to go on down there, getting some data in from Henry, yeah. and he reckons he can actually pop me in yeah. on, on one of Paul's actual excavations. So I'll, I'll leave you to your area. OK, I'll, though. I'm with me on. Good hunting. If Francis is right, there should be lots more to learn from the ring barrow and from the Neolithic houses. But finding them's proving tricky. Geophys couldn't do it, 
But if Henry's got his sums right, he should be able to plot their coordinates onto the ground. So, Henry, you reckon you've finally calculated the position of Paul's excavations? Yeah, well, this is going to be D2. D3's going to be over that way a bit. So oh, come on. <laughs> come on. How have you arrived at these precise positions from this? The only feature we, we know is B9. That's the one that Francis is digging. That's right. So, uh, everything's measured from there. But this isn't to scale. There's another map which has some of these features on, which has a scale on it. It's a long shot. <laughs> Why don't you give me that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Walk off out there and select a spot. <laughs> Despite Phil's scepticism, we're opening two trenches over what we hope are Neolithic houses. It's our last throw of the dice. If we can't find them this way, we never will. Luckily, there's good news from Myrtle Grove Farm. Geophys think they've spotted something that could be evidence of a prehistoric house. So we're putting in yet another trench. That's going on to it there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Seems quite a distinct change. That looks nice, so we just keep going back. So you're watching other people working? Well, I'm entitled every now and again to rest my weary bones. Besides, this is experimental archaeology. In what way? Well, I'm just having a nice cup of Jackie's Neolithic tea. So how do you make it, Jackie? Well, what we've done is we've put some elderflowers in the water and we've put some honey in. We had a hot stone yeah. and we just sizzled it slightly in some water. <laughs> That's it. You going to try some? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a yeah. See? Oh, nice, isn't it? Mm. The little flowers get... <laughs> <laughs> They're nutritious. <laughs> so what else are you going to be doing? Well, we're going to be doing some experiments to see actually how people might have lived in this landscape. And we thought uh, we might make uh, Phil a new hat. <laughs> Save yourself the trouble. I don't want a new hat. There's plenty of life left in this one, yeah? Phil, that is the most disgusting, stained piece of headwear in the whole of British archaeology. While Phil look. tries to hang on to his hat... Open in that corner, yeah. We're busy expanding our trenches on both farms. Yeah. So it is, it's curving through here. Yeah. We now know that John Poole didn't have the time or the technology to completely excavate this site. So we're picking up the story where he left off. It's a bit of a circle you got in the chalk there, isn't it? Well... On Long Furlong Farm, we found what he thought was a Neolithic dwelling. Move on over, yeah. Our search for the pit village is over. So instead, we focus all our energy on the ring barrow... Just down in that corner. ..in the desperate hope that we can make sense of what John Poole might have missed. Whoa, 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 whoa. And we've got our first find. How about this, then? But it's not exactly prehistoric. We've got evidence of Paul being here, look. F-R-Y... Frico. Oh. oh, but that's some good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> got that. Look, you need two bottles of it, though. <laughs> Just let's get on and clear the rest of the hole out. Early afternoon on day two, and we're still scraping away at that ring ditch. So that's bolt, that's hole. Get the pool stuff out first. Don't take the Neo stuff out, for we're all absolutely happy that we've got any modern contamination off. Francis! Yeah? Oh, hi, Kevin. Why have we exposed all of this when we knew it was here? You got me running all the way around this about 24 hours ago. Well, the thing is, John Paul didn't dig the whole thing out. And so what we're doing now, we're removing that very, very loose stuff which had been tipped back by John Paul to get down to the and an undisturbed ancient stuff. What could the stuff that he didn't dig out tell us? The stuff that he didn't see, that's going to be the stuff that went in first. So that's going to date the ditch precisely. So any finds in there are red hot. Oh, fantastic. Could that be a burial? I think it is. Yes, I do. Well, we have one piece of bone out of it from so far. Oh, yeah. That's bone all right, then. Yep. Francis. Yeah. Oh, I wasn't going to tell you about that, Tony. <laughs> is this another one here? Yeah. <laughs> oh, now, this is the money, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Thank God. Relief. <laughs> one thing I think we can rule out is that they are not settlement. They are not somebody living here. No, absolutely not. This is about death and the ancestors. People went to great lengths to associate themselves and their ancestors with this hill. But why? 
Well, it's probably no coincidence. The Black Patch was home to the most fundamental and precious commodity of prehistoric life, flint shot. Until about 6,000 years ago, during the Mesolithic, flint was chipped or napped to make axes and other tools. But then Neolithic people came up with a radical new technique that involved hours of careful polishing. 20 hours were That's a lot of effort. So was the new model more efficient or just better looking? The strange thing is, nobody knows. We've decided to find out. Eyeball to eyeball, they're like <laughs> the two champs. <laughs> We're about to conduct our own serious scientific research. Are you two taking this <laughs> seriously? <laughs> of course we are. Oh, right, are you ready? Oh, match fit, <laughs> match fit, soaked up. So on my left, we have the Mesolithic axe coming in at 7,000 BC. And on my right, the Neolithic axe coming in at a mere 3,000 BC. Well, 4,000 4, at least. 4,000 BC, yeah. you reckon? OK, yeah, I'll give you that. The Mesolithic axe was a masterpiece of practical design. I'm worried about the angle you're doing it at, Francis. Are you? Yeah. Stop being a backseat driver, oh, Maisie, right, and let him get on with it. <laughs> Quick to make and easy to repair, it was in every prehistoric toolkit. Go on, have a go, Phil. Oh, round one, over. Oh! Oh, it's all right. <laughs> so why, about 6,000 years ago, did Neolithic people introduce a new model? <laughs> one that took days of careful grinding to make or repair. It's like being yeah. under fire here with the shrapnel. That is working a lot better. Yeah. I'll tell you what. What's that? This axe seems to leave a much cleaner cut than the Mesolithic axe. You look at that surface there. Yeah, you, you've got proper axe facets, yeah. haven't you? It's a proper yeah. blade cutting. The the other side this is, is more bruising shred, more. Shredded. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's tearing shredded. It. Just looks as if he's been chewing it. it was... Oh, thanks. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's compare the edges. I mean, this this is really the old Mesolithic one. Mm. Is really bad, isn't it, mate? It's really. Uh, then it's got the wood. It's got into it's actually really into that it? Troy, and and uh, I mean that is presumably points of weakness. So over time, this Neolithic axe. Um, that's going to carry on as it is, but this Mesolithic axe, where the wood has got into these little crevices, it's it's going to get worse and worse in use. Would you would you reckon it's sort of ten times more durable than this? That's the sort of feeling I get. I mean, yeah, it's that sort of order of magnitude, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, I, I mean that's amazing, isn't that it? That is amazing. That's almost that like that's a bronze axe. Well done, that man. <laughs> Victory to the Neo! Yes! <laughs> Miles, we whipped all this off for you this morning so you could work out what was going on with your barrow. What is it doing? Uh, it's not a barrow, for a start. You're kidding. No, no, no. I mean, a de by definition, a barrow should have a, a burial in it or some kind of burial element, and this is the one thing this site has not got. So this little hole in the middle isn't a burial? No, no, no. This looks like it's actually a, a tree hole, some kind of natural feature. We might just have a, an enclosure ditch, some defining this kind of sacred space. That doesn't look like it's for a tree. No, indeed. We've got a, a series of rather stranger features coming out here, and you can see where Ratcha's digging all this flint. Where, whereabouts has this come from, then, Ratcha? It's just been in all of this fill, really. Uh, I've never dug anything like it before in my life. And if you just look in the section, it's just packed with lots and lots of flint. But that all... can't be natural, can it? You wouldn't get loads of flint like that just under the sink. No, I've never seen anything quite like this before, actually. It's been extracted from a flint mine, and then they've actually chosen to place all this flint back in this hole. What about in your hole, Matt? Well, it's not strictly my hole, because I started off on what I thought was a feature here, but actually I'm coming round and I'm joining up with Rakshar's feature there as well. So we're actually both in the same feature, which is quite large and goes around like that. What do you think it might be? Well, it could be a shaft. A, sh a shaft, like a, a like flint, a, like mine, a flint mine, but one enclosed by this bank and ditch. How deep might a shaft be? Well, if, it, if we go by the shafts on the other side in the flint mining area, we could be going down six metres. Ah, and <laughs> just to remind you, it's ten to four on day three. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Which means we've got to get cracking if we're going to make sense of this weird stash of flint. But it's not our first unexpected find. We've been here for the best part of three days now, and all that time you've been sitting here in front of the trench, <laughs> good as gold. <laughs> this is taking you back to your youth, isn't it? Absolutely. 
And I'll show you what we found in that trench there. Yes. Look, a oh. couple of pop bottles, which your dad must have buried <laughs> when he backfilled the trenches. There are Fryco. You know well, that this... company? Yes, I do. It's uh, quite a well-known Sussex name. So could these have been yours? It might have been the picnics we had up here with the neighbours. The picnic in the photo? Yes. <laughs> You're going to stay here till the bitter end tonight, aren't you? Oh, yes, because we must see the finale. <laughs> As we race to make sense of the barrow or mine or whatever it might be, the bigger picture is beginning to take shape. Sometime about 6,000 years ago, people came to Blackpatch. They sunk mines in search of flint and used that flint to clear the trees. After mining drew to a close, this became a sacred place. About 4,000 years ago, our ring barrow was built and ritual pits placed around it. A thousand years later, Black Patch became what it is today, a place of settlement and farming. Ta-da! God! <laughs> Neolithic man. <laughs> Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses, and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support to make more episodes. 30 years ago, the Legg family took over this farm in West Dorset. Almost immediately, they discovered that one end of this field was difficult to plough, and they put it down to the stony soil. But then, earlier this year, Roman finds started to crop up all over the field. Roof tile, pottery, Roman coins, brooches. What's going on? The legs are itching to know. Is there a Roman building here that could account for their broken ploughs? Time Team's got just three days to find out and let them know. Geophys have been at it since dawn. We're also metal detecting and walking the field. There's enough space between the maize plants to look for more Roman pot or tile just lying on the surface. If finds are clustering, we can investigate the hotspots. But the truth is, we're sticking in a trench on a broad scatter of metal detectorist finds and outside the Geophys survey area. I wonder if our spectators have got any idea of how close to disaster we are. So what we do then is we'll, we'll strip a bit of an area yeah. rather than just going straight down. That's right. Strip then an area it, and you know, then try in it. In case there's still stuff in the, in the top All right, soil. we'll okay. do that. Is there a bit of a figure there? Well, it could be, couldn't it? it could Our be. Roman double act, Guy and Richard, have been looking at what kind of Roman coins have been found to see if the dates and values give us any clues as to why they were here. Do we reckon we know what we've got now? Yep, quite a few coins. Yes, I know we've got coins. Even I know we've got coins. What kind of date? Early second, speeding up in the third, quite a lot of fourth century stuff. Are they valuable? In ancient terms, no. So what does that imply? You'd either use them for everyday purchase on market stalls or fairgrounds or something like that and not worry if you lost them, or if you're giving them to a shrine or something, the tendency is always to give the worst stuff, the copies, the forgeries, the foreign coins. So lots of finds but no structure? Yeah, we've got a real mystery. The coins are great, the brooches are great. It's a very, very strange place. May as well call in the wrinkled professor while we're at it. <laughs> I'm worried when you have a stern no. face. We got, our, we got what looks like our natural look coming yeah. on there. But look, there's some looks coming round here and we appear to have an edge. What I was requesting is to take out a bit of this. Yeah, take out a bit more. And, and see whether or not we can... I mean, this, if this is a, a ditch or something like this coming round... Yeah. Put you a need slot. to see that natural, the other side. That's why it's exactly what I'm yeah. saying. OK, let's do that. What Phil thinks he's got is a man-made ditch cut into the natural geology. He's found one edge, and to confirm it, he needs to find the other one. Oh, that's the other side of it then. Nice one. We now have two edges to our ditch. 
Just outside the ditch, Matt has been exploring an area where detectorists have found a cluster of coins. And it's produced something rather interesting. Matt, mm -hmm. you see I've got this kind of black circle thing here. Yeah. I think we should get um, a metal detector or something over them. Can we borrow Can we you for a minute? Sweep over these two. It's not very promising, no. is it? Ah. Oi! Well, if you dig it out in chunks from yeah. a good distance away and then break out a big lump, we'll get Will to go over the chunks that we take out. Yeah. Ah, I see. So it's in there somewhere. So now we just, if we just split it up into two or three, yeah. and then Will can go over each bit. So let's spread that out a bit. Ah. Hey! There you go. A Look find, a find. Oh, beautiful. A find. Mark! Come and have a look at this, mate. Got another one. Oh, yes. Can you tell anything about that or does it need to be cleaned up? Well, it's going to be either late 3rd or 4th century OD. How do you like know other, that? The size and thickness alone, that, that's enough to, to give a good indication. So what are all these Roman coins doing in a prehistoric site? The answer is not in Roger's mysterious shadowy square. Bridget has found only geology, so his bolts must have been sheared by plain old rocks. Even though everyone's bottling up their feelings, it's been a tense and frustrating day for the archaeologists. Nerves are beginning to fray, particularly when one of the crew steps into Phil's newly cleaned trench. Bridge. Uh, David! Sorry, sir. And on the other side of the hedge, the hunt for the all-important centre of the barrow is also proving frustrating. No one can agree where it is. I've faced it and I think that's where the centre is. K for Kerry? Yeah, <laughs> not a chance. Yeah. We'll mark the perimeter and we'll see who's right. Well, well, I'm, I'm going to extend it from the trench bit. And oh, see. you do what you want. <laughs> Stand there, you know. Yeah, it's it's fine. Fine. What length have you got? There. Centre. Centre. Two centres then. Two, Two centres. centres. Got three different you points. were right <laughs> mardy this morning about this site, yeah. weren't you? I'm yeah. never very good in the morning. <laughs> no, but about this site you were going, oh I don't know if there's anything here. I think, I think it was quite a sort of high risk thing actually, you know. We had a, a group of fines and a few other finds that might or might not have been, you know, Roman tile and so on. And it seemed a lot to, <laughs> to base the, you know, the work on. It seems to have paid off this time. Well, it does, yeah, it does. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> What's going on over there? Guys, I don't know why you're squabbling. We're going to be digging a trench about five by five. It really doesn't matter whether the centre's on Kerry's point, on Henry's point or on John's point. What matters is, are we going to find anything in it? We'll know tomorrow. Beginning of day two, yesterday we found this beautiful Bronze Age ditch, which the archaeologists are saying ought to be part of a burial mound. So yesterday evening we projected where the rest of the curve of the ditch should be so that we could excavate the centre of it and hopefully find the burial. But this being time team, there's a fly in the ointment. Mick, come here, what's the problem? Well, when I was up in the crane last night when everybody else had gone home, looking down on the site, it seemed to me that this curve of the ditch that we got here like that yeah. was actually wider than what we were projected in the field next door. But we had three guys working that out last night so they all got it wrong. Well they may not have got it wrong it just looked different from above and yeah. it, it worried me that we might be basing where the ditch was and basing therefore where the middle was on you know it just didn't look right. Even though everyone's bottling up their feelings it's been a tense and frustrating day for the archaeologists. Nerves are beginning to fray, particularly when one of the crew steps into Phil's newly cleaned trench. Uh, David! Sorry, sir. Oh. Phil, can we walk across your lovely ditch? Yeah, that's all right, Tony. Mark! Yes. You got something for us? Yes, Tony. At the end of yesterday, having cleaned back in this area, scanned by uh, one of the metal detector users, and we got these three little shallow scoops 
and in the bottom of each one, a Roman coin. Wow! It's a third and fourth century ID. So do you think these were actually put into those holes deliberately? Yes. So not only have we found a new Bronze Age barrow, perhaps 4,000 years old, but also the first evidence of Roman veneration for a prehistoric monument in this part of Britain, 2,000 years later. On the other side of the hedge, the search is now on for more sections of the ring ditch to get a fix on where the centre of the barrow is. That's crucial because it's where you'd find a burial in a classic monument from the Bronze Age. To get to the bottom of its history, Phil's been cutting vertically down through the stuff that filled the original ditch. And he's very pleased with his work. I think that is an absolutely impeccably cut section. That will be so plumb, people will write books about it. Even though the mound itself has been ploughed away, bits of Bronze Age pot are circumstantial evidence of cremation burials in a classic barrow. It's one of the practices that arrived in Britain in the Bronze Age. At the bottom of Phil's beautiful little trench, there are some mysterious features which are exciting miles. You see we've got these, like, almost like post holes oh, right. and post pipes in each section, look. They look they're quite, quite clear as post holes. We were just debating whether that's the sort of thing you'd expect to get. You do, in, in quite a few uh, later Bronze Age, and indeed early Bronze Age barrows, the ditch acts as a palisade trench. So you've effectively secured the timbers right at the base of the ditch, uh, and the soil's then piled up around them. This is intriguing. A palisade around a barrow is definitely not a common feature of Bronze Age monuments. We've revealed most of the ring ditch on the other side of the hedge. Now we can try to work out where the centre is and whatever it might hold. We're also still looking for possible Roman reuse of the barrow. Remember those Romans who brought us here? It's got to be late Neolithic or early Bronze Age, I would have thought. Really? Amazingly, to an expert like Phil, a stone tool can be dating evidence. The trimming on this scraper suggests skilled craftsmanship from the Neolithic or Stone Age. Perfect thing for holding Jim. <laughs> <laughs> These skills were largely lost in the Bronze Age when metal replaced stone tools. It may add yet another thousand years to our monument, and that would definitely account for the odd features. Is it true that he wasn't that interested in archaeology until we came along? That's right, absolutely true. <laughs> Can't keep him away now. <laughs> so is it part of an entrance complex? Uh, definitely not, no. no. No, looking at it, it's starting to worry me whether it's actually some kind of quarry, because the sides of it are extremely irregular. Right. And there's not an awful lot of material in it either. I see, so they've used that to actually make the mound. That would be a nice assumption to make, actually. So one oddity explained, but there's another in the barrow itself. Bridge and Ian are investigating an intriguing area of the ring ditch, which has clearly been filled with burnt material. The thing about this ring that's amazing is the finds that are coming out. They're coming out left, right and centre, and it's Ian who's really finding them, and I'm just looking at him jealous as anything. <laughs> what have you got? <laughs> well, he's just finding all these tools here. Cool. Look at them all. I mean, we've got, he's got this one here, wonderful thing. It's a scraper. He used to scrape off hides and things like that. There's this one here. That's another scraping edge. He's found there. this one here. <laughs> There's all sorts of things. They've also found some pottery in here. Absolutely brilliant stuff. This one here. You could have a thumb decoration there or a lug that's fallen off. What kind of period do you reckon this is? Well, I'd go for Bronze Age, but very early Bronze Age. Maybe transitional. I think you're probably about right, and I think one of the really good key indicator that sort of provoked discussion is from this piece of pottery here. It's a rim, and it's got whipcord decoration. What do you mean by that? Well, can you see here? You've got, like, a piece of string has been pressed into the wet clay before it was dried. The string decoration would have been applied before this massive collared urn was fired, about 4,000 years ago. Absolutely wonderful. It's just the most exciting trench I've worked on 
I don't know for how long. Do we know much about these Neolithic people? Well, we're really dealing with the, the first agriculturalists, the first farmers, the first builders of monuments uh, in the Neolithic. Uh, prior to the Neolithic, we just got sort of hunters and gatherers, not really having much of an impact, but the Neolithic farmers are the first people who start building things, big monuments in the landscape, cutting down trees, ploughing fields. What sort of date? Well, it, it dates from around about 4000 BC. So our monuments at the tail end of it, it's about 3000 BC. Can we work out anything about them as people? Um, we, we can. We, actually, finding the, the skeletal evidence is often quite rare. We find bits of bodies, but we don't find complete individuals. And that might be what our, our monument is. It might be a place where bodies are left to decompose and then selected pieces are taken away for burial elsewhere. Do you find many monuments like this around here? Not around here, no. No, so this is actually quite rare. It fills in a nice gap uh, in our Neolithic map. We appear to have lurched more than 3,000 years back in time since we arrived at the site. Poor old Victor has been struggling to keep up with this archaeological mystery tour. It's not that long since he rubbed out the Romans. Right, oh wow. God. Hello, Victor. Well, that's a lovely drawing of a Bronze Age round mound. Um, I've got a bit of bad news, though, I'm afraid. No. <laughs> uh, we, material that's coming up now looks uh, Neolithic. So I oh. think we've added about a 1,000 years onto the date of the, the mound. Redrawing is in order there. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, re redesign, I'm afraid. But as far as the activity is concerned, what would they be...? <laughs> well, that, that, that is the um, six million dollar question, really. What is going on inside? Our evidence for a number of these sites is you get bits of human remains in the ditch. Right. And one suggestion is this is a, an exposure burial site where oh. bodies decompose. Probably not the, sort of the nicest of pictures to do, but possibly a yeah. bodies decomposing in the centre uh, and bits rolling off into the ditches. Wow. <laughs> Stewart's come up with yet another piece of evidence that supports Miles' theory that this may be a Neolithic site. It's all to do with the visibility of the site from the surrounding countryside. This landscape has just thrown some real surprises in here. This model here shows, the green shows the, the high ground, and the other colours show the low ground, where the monument can't be seen. It's there. So essentially, you can see it when you're some way away, but when you're near, it's invisible. That, it, that's a very Neolithic thing to do, to uh, get seclusion. You're not wanting to show off to the landscape, you're actually wanting sort of privacy around it, and our site has got that quality. If you look where the rivers are, here, we've put the rivers on this 3D view of the site there. It's like in the middle of the circle of all those rivers, isn't it? It, it is, and it's actually sitting right in that triangle of them. Again, typical Neolithic thing, putting monuments close to watersheds and sources of rivers. This site has produced one of the biggest range of finds we've ever seen on Time Team. From 5,000-year-old Neolithic chert tools to 500-year-old medieval coins, there's something from every period. And together, they've unlocked the secrets of this site. We came here looking for a Roman temple and instead found what we thought was a classic Bronze Age barrow. But it's now clear that our thing began its life in the Neolithic about 5,000 years ago, as an enclosure ringed by a ditch and quite possibly by a palisade which was later burnt. Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan-funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more.